that's actually what she's doing.
And it was a new first to me because I was just like, we need to <laughs> Okay. Good, good, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Uh, I think that we may have more people streaming than we have physically in the uh, in the room, but we would like to uh, welcome. Um, let me see. I got to find the name. <laughs> Dr. McCotton, McCotton to our speaker series uh, Tuesday talks. We kind of have a double. Uh, uh, double title with our uh, with our program this morning. Uh, Dr. McCotton is an original eagle. She uh, earned oh. her degree here a few years ago, and we would like to welcome her back to the Rolling Hills at Vernon Green. And we look so forward to um, sharing with her and having a conversation with her this morning about not only herself but about higher education and her contributions to the academy and her life works. Welcome, Dr. McCoy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dean Beard. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, let me just kind of echo the sentiments of, uh, of our Dean and on behalf of the Chancellor, faculty, staff, uh, and students at NCCU. Uh, let me I just welcome you all to the Spring 2023 speaker series that's hosted by the College of Education. And of course, I want to thank uh, our illustrious Dean, uh, Dr. Audrey Beard, for inviting me uh, to be here with you this morning. I'm especially pleased to uh, read and welcome our speaker back. As uh, Dean Beard stated, she's one of our own. Uh, I'm speaking about Dr. Tracy McCullum uh, Cotton. And uh, she is a scholar, she is an author, a writer, uh, and just an all-around brilliant uh, thinker. And so, again, I want to thank her for coming back home this morning. And uh, we welcome her back um, um, with us so she can share with us any ideas that are percolating, uh, certainly in her mind, but we also recognize the importance of our students seeing through her and this experience what they too can become in life. Uh, as a 2009 graduate of North Carolina Central University, uh, I'm sure that she traversed the sloping hills and Burton Green of this institution. I'm sure that on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the 1040 break, she was down in the green the 1040 break. break. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what's going on right now yes. uh, at the campus. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she went on to earn a doctorate in sociology from Emory University and now as an associate professor at one of our sister institutions. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And so, um, in addition to all of that, of course, she is a MacArthur Foundation uh, Fellow, which is a very high honor. But I think that a significant factor in her, her achievements was, in fact, her matriculation at North Carolina Central University. And so, through the faculty and staff that nurtured her, uh, some of whom may be online now, some may be in the room now, uh, that they can bask and the glory of her success. Mm -hmm. And I really do feel that one of the true hallmarks of a scholar is not only their own contribution to research in their discipline, really uh, another part of that is how they inspire and develop their students. And so uh, simply put, if uh, NCCU uh, has prepared her to do these things and to be great, we can still prepare our students to do, uh, today to do similar things and to be great uh, as well if they accept the challenge. So Dr. Cotton, uh, I look forward to hearing your uh, remarks this uh, morning and welcome back home. Thank you so much. Sir. Sure. Like Provost Justin, thank you for that uh, reading and uh, for the introduction as well uh, for Dr. Cotton. Uh, and hello everyone, welcome to North Carolina Central University. Um, this Tuesday Together uh, National Speaker Series um, that we started last academic year has been incredible, right? We've been able to invite all sorts of leaders and scholars and educators from all from around the country. Um, just thinking about uh, in the past, we've gotten to hear from, hear from rather, uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum, 
uh, Governor Barnes was like, hey, we've been together in the cafeteria. We've heard from General Jackson Jr., who's the incoming provost at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we've heard from Terrell Strayhorn just recently, uh, uh, noted author on Sense of Belonging. And we've heard from just a wide array of folk who are doing some really interesting and innovative work uh, at the intersection of higher education, but also race, culture, um, uh, and things of that nature. So um, I'm really delighted today because we have an NCCU alumni joining us, uh, Dr. Tressy Common. She's a sociologist, a public thinker, a professor with the Center for Information Technology and Public Life at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's a New York Times columnist. And as the provost mentioned, she's a 2020 uh, MacArthur Genius Fellow. Her collection of essays, thick, uh, investigating how black women's lives are deeply shaped by structural racism and inequality, was a National Book Award finalist. And she was named a top, was named a top book in 2019 by time. The New York Times Book Review, the New York Public Library, and the Chicago Tribune. Her first book, Laura Ed, examined and critiqued the role of for-profit colleges in the American economic landscape and their contributions to inequality in the country. And Laura Ed was actually my introduction to Cotton's work. And ever since, I've just been blown away by her use of words, by the way she's able to just weave together words in a really uh, thought-provoking way. In um, I assigned Laura Ed uh, when I was on the faculty at Suffolk University in Boston uh, teaching a course on critical issues in higher education, uh, and really looking at the role of for-profit colleges in higher education. Um, Cotton's ongoing New York Times opinion columns offer perspectives on culture, on politics, and on the economics of our everyday lives. So for this morning, I will moderate the uh, conversation and then open up the discussion to you. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Cotton. Hi, thank you everybody and those who are joining us. Uh, remotely, and I'd like to thank the Dean and the Provost for your official welcome and then for your informal welcome back home. That's how you get welcome back home. Nobody welcomes back home for me, so thank you for that. And it is important, I think, uh, to know that truly, uh, I think my uh, original class here at North Carolina Central University really made 1040 great what 1040 great is. <laughs> important for me uh, to state my flag in that. I just wanted to say that broadly yeah, to bio. everyone. Thank you very much. And then also thank you, Dr. McGillan, for inviting me back. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so the first question I have for you is, is, is start out by letting us know what inspired you to uh, work in higher education. Oh, goodness gracious, inspiring uh, work in higher education. Um, you know, uh, my biography is not one that probably lent itself uh, to that originally. My family is from Eastern North Carolina, which I can say that I think here it really means something culturally to the people in this room. I can't always say that in the national landscape, but it means something. Uh, the cultural geography of what it means to be from Eastern North Carolina, which is that the expectations are not that you will join academia. We could say we had high educational aspirations, certainly. I come from a family that valued education. Um, but you you got a job, right? We valued education both for its practical uh, significance as well as for its like you know sort of spiritual ed edification. And so the idea was that yes, you go and get your education. But like I like to say, we knew like five jobs, and they were lawyer, <laughs> teacher, nurse, do nurse <laughs> thank you, right? doctor. We knew jobs, people. And in fact, one of the reasons why I ended up at North Carolina State University is it had the law school. Mm -hmm. And my family understood that little girl can talk. <laughs> Talking is something lawyers do. That would be a good job for a little girl who talks good. Perfect job, right? Um, academia, hard to pay, not quite something we understood. And um, so really, up until up until really the very end, by which I mean, you know, applying and getting into graduate school at that point in my life, I was still planning to go to law school. I was filling out LSAT applications secretly mm -hmm. because it just it was it didn't crystallize in my mind as a career path. It wasn't clear. It was very fuzzy. I wasn't quite sure what research was. It wasn't quite um, clear about what my life would look like. Right, the professions were clear, jobs were clear to me, and it was material. 
um, it's something I talk to, especially sort of my first generation or second generation students um, about all the time, about trying to make this work legible to them uh, in a way, and something I take very seriously in my public work, about trying to make this work legible. Um, because that just mattered so much to me. It was so illegible to me in certain kinds of ways. Um, so I'm not sure that I chose it as much as this is certainly where my skill set was. And each step of the way, I would kind of show up in these spaces that seemed so elite. And I would show up, and once I got there, it just wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> or certainly the things that, um, that seemed um, so illegible, once I peel back the veneer of prestige and peel back the layer of cultural capital, which is that some people have been trained for this their whole life, once I peel that back, the actual work, I was suited to well enough thinking critically, um, making an argument, being disciplined about reading, writing, and evidence, right? Well, I had been defending what I thought my whole life. That's what it meant to be a person of color and rationalizing my experiences, right? Like, I understood how to do the actual work of higher education. Doing it systematically, certainly learning the rules of it once I could figure out what they were. Um, so once I, you know, peeled back again the cultural capital and all of that of it, that I understood how to do. Um, and in fact, a lot of what I learned uh, was through a program that I learned about here at North Central in the Career Services Program. I did this uh, career prep program that I learned about in Career Services called uh, the More Undergraduate Research Apprentice Program that was about training uh, minority students who might consider a research degree. And that's what that was about. It was about putting us in a room and demystifying what research looks like. Um, and so I think that was sort of my point of entree. But yeah, um, you know, learning how to demystify it was probably the hardest part. But the skill sets were, you know, those things could be learned is what I, you know, kind of figured out. Yeah. And I think in some ways this is a good segue uh, to the next question. Um, and it's how does your educational background as an English and political science oh, yeah. um, along the central uh, help to shape your philosophy? practice as a, as really as a public intellectual, as a scholar, as a teacher, and as a leader? Oh, goodness. In so many ways, large and small, that I think I still figure out a small way almost, you know, every month, uh, you know, some little way will show up in my work that will surprise me. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that I really do care not just about the quality of the argument, which I care about that a great deal, um, but I care that the argument is elegant. That's the English training, right? That's the, that's the English training, which was that I, I learned here and through coming from a family and a culture, frankly, the, you know, the black literature tradition uh, fundamentally believes that the only thing that had ever truly changed history was a powerful story. And we believed that we were evidence of that. That's the black liberatory tradition, right? And everything about our literature and our history and our culture was evidence of that. Our very survival was evidence of that, right? You take the people, you rip them um, from their political and uh, spiritual home, and you drop them into a hostile political economy, and somehow they still survive it. And they do that virtually through their ability to manage to make a story that's bigger and better than the story that is told about them. And that story has bigger weapons, and it has more violent rhetoric, and somehow we write a bigger and better story, and our story wins. And so I have to believe that my story not only needs to be empirically sound, but it needs to be better. And so I care about the craft of writing. And as you well know, in academia, we don't often care about that. <laughs> and so, um, and so, you know, I just very early on, as I was learning the skill of being an academician, I just wasn't willing to give that up. I just thought, no, it matters that it's elegant. It matters that the story is pretty. It matters that I care about the sentence level crafting. 
Um, and I wasn't I, I wasn't willing to dismiss that because I had come out of that tradition. Um, so that, um, I, what I think I got from, um, you know, our version of political science, you know, there's this, uh, the, the, the canon of liberal arts um, uh, is very, can be very Western in the traditional academic canon. And ours, I like to tell people, we had that, but we infused every bit of our learning here with this inherent critical thought about the Western canon. And it happened not just in political science, but it happened in my math classes, it happened in science classes, and it was a sort of holding up of the canon to see what was missing. And I think that not, I don't think it, I know for a fact it is why I always have this highly developed sense of holding up what I learned um, from academia with a very healthy dose of distance from it to see what's missing and who is missing. That I think just made me a sharper thinker. Um, you know, I get sometimes from like my colleagues or peers or critics who read my work and they'll be like, where did you get that idea? Where did you get that perspective? Like, how did you put that together? And I'll be thinking to myself, how didn't you? <laughs> and I'll, sometimes I'll step back and I'll go, oh, because you accepted it. And I just never accept whatever the line is, whatever the status quo is. And I have to think that is because I come from a version of liberal arts training that had an inherent critical faculty for liberal arts that understood that, yes, we needed to know what the liberal arts were, but we needed to know where we were missing in the canon. And I took that with me into graduate study and beyond. And I just think it made me a better thinker. So thanks. <laughs> so one of the things I feel like we often talk about in a higher education administration program is trying to balance work and life. Especially since, at least for me, I spend a lot of time in front of a computer. Oh, right. uh, so I guess I, I'm wondering if you could reflect on um, how you balance your work life. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Real talk. I don't but okay, that's when I was trying to be more serious. How do I balance work and life? Yes. Um, I mean, no, I guess that was the real talk. I mean, I'm not great at it. I'm, I'm working on being better. I mean, I guess aren't we all, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but like I try to tell people, I'm going to be honest with you, it gets easier to even try to balance it the more, you know, status and power you have professionally. Mm -hmm. Like, let me just be real. Mm -hmm. Earlier in your career, there's no balance mm -hmm. because everybody has more control over your career than you do. Mm -hmm. Peer reviewers, uh, senior faculty, administrator, like everybody, student, student review, everybody. <laughs> everybody has mm -hmm. more power over your career than you do. <laughs> so like, balance, like what? No. Um, <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> and then you start to get a little bit more of that power back. It's okay. Like, maybe you get a, you know, here's some publication. Okay. Ooh, all right. So maybe stuff matters a little less. And then you get a tenure. Oh, okay. But then, like, nobody tells you. And which is what I found. Like, you woke up and you had a little bit more autonomy. But it's not like anybody told me that. <laughs> And it's not like my body listened, even if someone had told me. I was so set to, you know, 10 that I think even if someone had told me, oh, you can chill a little bit, I'm not sure my body listened because I've been in this mode for so long um, that I don't know that I had any other skills. <laughs> um, okay, so I haven't said this, sorry, that didn't help. I'm so sorry, but um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I will say, strangely enough, if, uh, the, if there is an upside, and there are not many, COVID in a weird way mm -hmm. 
And I heard a lot of black women in particular mm -hmm. who said this, mm -hmm. because it's not that it just made us sit down, yeah. it's that it made everybody else sit down too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> like not only did we get down, but like everybody else was resting too, whether they wanted to or not. And so at least like some of the incoming slowed down. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember there was this moment when I panicked because there was nothing uh, coming yeah. at me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I guess this is what sitting down is like. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we, you know, for good or for bad, I don't know that we have come out of COVID elegantly as we should have or as mainly as we should have. What I've been trying to do is hold on to some of that feeling of what it meant to sit down mm -hmm. as we've come out of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, with varying degrees of success, again, I'll be very honest with y'all since I'm at home, varying degrees of success, like I'm trying to remember Oh, this is what it's like to turn off the computer before like midnight, which I do try to do now. This is what it is like to go outside and touch grass. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what it's like to say no to some things, even though I would really like to do them. And this is what it's like to not think that every offer is the last time I'm going to get mm -hmm. that good offer. That's, That's what it's like, like a lot. Yeah. Um, Saying no, not because it's bad, but saying no to something good is even harder. Like, oh, if I say no, like they're never going to come back around again, right? Like, um, so, uh, so trying to remember that, and that this is a long life, this is a long career, and there'll be waves, and like trying to figure that out. Um, you know, and forcing myself to do it, uh, which looks like building in the time since, since I have learned to live by my calendar, mm -hmm. putting the time on my calendar to do something that isn't work. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds very type A, but I put stuff like go hike on my calendar. Mm -hmm. I'm much more inclined to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since I know how to be a student, I do things like take classes for fun. I know that sounds so corny. I'm so bad. <laughs> but like, I'm more inclined to take a class in dancing, which is working out, than I am to just casually work out. Mm -hmm. So I do belly dancing classes. Mm -hmm. See how I trick myself? Yes. <laughs> right, right, because if I sign up for it, because see, I'm a nurse, so see, I know how to go to a class, <laughs> right? So stuff like that is like I had to learn how to, Thank you, thank you. See, I had to work with it instead of against it. I just know, I, yeah, so figuring out the kind of skill set we developed, trying to work with it instead of against it. Yeah. That's a powerful lesson. Yeah. I'll capture that one. Okay. I might employ it. Okay. <laughs> Next time I come back, let's talk about the classes we all signed up. Okay. <laughs> Um, so the next question is, uh, I must ask you about your work nowadays uh, as it pertains to public writing, right? Um, so I guess, can you talk to us a little bit about your vision uh, in terms of your essay writing? Yeah, yeah that was, uh, wow, first of all, right? Yeah, um, like what's a girl from a uh, family from Red Springs, North Carolina doing at the New York Times? Not sure they knew what they were doing. Uh, so good luck to them on that. <laughs> it's working out. It's actually working out. Out quite well. Um, we, I'm not sure. Uh, my vision has evolved as the relationship has evolved, and I really saw myself as too fiercely independent to ever do this. Um, I had been writing for myself, by myself. You know, anybody can tell me what to. All right, because uh, that's who I am. That's what I come from. Uh, and so, you know, we negotiated, we negotiated, and I ultimately ended up deciding. Though that this is what I wanted to do for the people and the things I care about. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, I have a chance to say what I want to say reliably. Every time I go up and back, I'm going to talk to every single time. I'm talking to 50 million people every single time. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And I thought, <laughs> and then I thought, ooh, okay. Because <laughs> there is, I will be very honest with you. You can talk all that, they talk all you want to, but every single time that number is in your head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then I had to look myself in the mirror and go, okay, little girl. <laughs> As my mother would say to me, what you gonna do, little girl? And every single time, but it is, I do feel a responsibility to, okay, well then what are you gonna do with it? You're here, mm -hmm. or you do something. 
well with it, not just good, do something well, mm-hmm. meaning for the wellness of the things that you said you cared about. Because now is your time to show and prove. <laughs> it is easier to talk smack from outside of the club. Mm-hmm. It is harder <laughs> to do it from inside of the club. <laughs> okay, so I care very much that I am in that room sounding like the people who made me. So the first thing is that I wanted to attend to my voice, that it did not sound like the New York Times, whatever that meant to other people. That means I will not sound like Nick Kristoff, I will not sound like Ezra Klein, I will not sound as much as you may or may not respect them. I will sound like the people who made me. I will sound like my great grandmother, I will sound like the institutions that invested in me, I will sound like this place. That means my references will be rooted in the cultural tradition that I value. That means when I make a metaphor, it will be rooted in the language tradition that I value. And if you don't get it, look it up. And that's what I do when somebody when they make some reference. To, I don't know what a some some sailing reference is. They love sailing references. I mean, I'm sailing. And I always have to look up what the front of the boat is. I don't know what that is. Right? But guess what I do? I look it up. So if my references are rooted in Saturday morning hair grooming rituals, mm-hmm. look it up, mm-hmm. right? And so that's one thing. I care very much about the voice, and I try to bring that with me. Then I try to care about my perspective, which is rooted in cultural geography, the South as a place and as a tradition. I try to care about those institutions that are rooted in the South and say, okay, what can I say from this perspective? on the news, on ideas, pop culture, whatever it is from here, what does the national news look like differently from this vantage point? We know what it looks like from New York. We know what it looks like globally from a New York perspective, right? But what does it look like from here? What do do you see differently if you look at it from this perspective? And then I think about class, I think about social class. What does that look like differently if you couldn't always assume that you were going to be okay? Right. Does that look, does that landscape look different? And I, you know, and I try to always like sort of write into those things, which is kind of easy enough because that's who I am. And, you know, um, it gets a little harder, I think, as I get sort of like further away and I worry about that a little bit. But like, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm still of my family. I'm still with you know, people, place, and things. But I always try to make sure I don't get too um, far away from those things. Um, but I have a, a wide latitude about what I can write about and, um, and I think some of my concerns about like having any sort of like institutional oversight were you know unfounded. I really I still choose whatever matters to me, and so um, I still have that autonomy. Um, have a whole lot of freedom, um, and really have very little pushback on like uh, voice. All those things I think but way. I have I have far more constraints in my mind than I've had in practice. Um, which I think was a big lesson for me. I think we have sometimes internalized more shackles than we have in reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's sometimes we internalize what a thing means, the status of it. Um, but if you've been invited into the room, it's your room too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ezra Klein said something to me when I was thinking about joining. He said, Trusty, sometimes people think that they are, that the institution of the New York Times doesn't matter to them. He said, and then they get invited to be at the New York Times. And you show up and you start disciplining yourself to sound like the Times, to do like the Times, what you think the New York Times is. Mm-hmm. And the very thing that you were critiquing before you got here. You become it. Even though nobody asked you to do it. He says, so just come here and be trusted. Um, and I really appreciated that advice because I didn't realize that even for all of my oppositional, you have a little bit of, you can have a little bit of that in you. Um, so I just always try to make sure I keep a check on that. But yeah, you know. So I just try to sound like myself and write about the things I care about. I think one of the things you mentioned is the sort of the public criticism that could happen or may happen. So I wonder, do you read all the things that <laughs> oh. come about on social media? <laughs> no. 
And I think people think I'm lying. I have one of the good things about coming up the way I did, I think, in you know, public writing or public intellectualism, is that it really did happen organically. I was writing for myself 15 years ago. Other people found me. I had a blog. I was writing for myself. I was trying to survive graduate school. <laughs> but I had this little blog where I was writing my little stuff because I was trying to survive. <laughs> uh, I had come from North Carolina Central, from mostly black institutions. Even before that, I had gone to West Charlotte High School before, for some of you who know. I had never been in a predominantly white institution until I got to Emory. Uh, I was trying to survive it. So my blog was a way where I was like working my way through ideas and whatnot in a way to survive Emory. Uh, and an audience found me. I was not one of these people who was early on crafting myself as the next, you know. <laughs> no! <laughs> people had this idea that I had some big master plan. No! And an audience found me and, you know, God helped me. I think I did the best with it, you know, as, as I could over time. Um, but th there was no big master plan. But one of the great things about coming up through that organically is that I developed some coping skills along the way. Mm -hmm. I have not Googled myself, mm -hmm. searched mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. on Twitter, mm -hmm. or read a comment since 2013 at mm -hmm. least. Mm -hmm. I do not know. I have never. I do not know what y'all say about me. <laughs> <laughs> what you think about it, it, when you get it, is entirely your business. And I consider it a social faux pas for you to send me what other people <laughs> 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 The easiest way for you to get cut out of my life okay, is to send me what somebody said about me. <laughs> oh, okay, I see a hater one. I know a hater. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> but no, 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 sir. I mean, official criticism to me is I wrote a book, and academics peer reviewed it and write a critical review and it's published. You know why? Academics have a culture of reviewing to improve the science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People on the internet are not trying to improve my life. <laughs> 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 They're not trying to help. <laughs> right? People on the internet are making points or scoring points in an imaginary game mm -hmm. of tic-tac-toe. Mm -hmm. I th that is not that that's not the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I also have a question about I want you to sort of look ahead to the challenges that we might anticipate in higher education and maybe even help us think through some solutions. So what are, what are some of the things you can think about as a potential? Well, listen, um, when I was writing Lower Ed, uh, you, you know, when, one of the things that happens, especially when you write a book, it's less true when you write an article. But when you write a book and it goes out to the world, he's talking about uh, um, reviews, right? Is that you cannot control what other people's main takeaway from the book is. <laughs> I wish you could. Um, and I love the review of that book. Listen, that book changed my life. And I'll be forever grateful. And I stand by it 150% and all of that. But one of the things that I wish and I had hoped people's takeaway uh, from that book was, was that I thought that what was happening in the for-profit college sector was a canary in the coal mine for all of higher education. It was not that for-profit colleges were the greatest perversion mm -hmm. of higher ed. I was saying that's a lab. Mm -hmm. And they are testing out a lot of stuff over there that I think is coming for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Yes, you got some perversions of things, right? Like legitimacy is out the door, right? They've completely taken black folks' belief in higher education and just being completely right, um, I think, you know, have transgressed it, right, and perverted it. But stuff like, oh, they're look, they're seeing how far we're willing to go with giving up faculty tenure, right? They don't have a tenure system there. They're seeing how far they can go with centralizing curriculum control. They're seeing how far they're willing to go with this idea of student as customer, right? They were seeing how far you could go with centralizing marketing control and branding with the enrollment control function, right? They, they were testing a lot. Of, and what do we see 10, 15 years later? Yes, we've seen this rapid diffusion, completely deliberate across all of higher education, 
And I thought, well, there you go. So what do I see? I see more of that. I see more of this consolidation. Um, what we're seeing in the cultural wars rhetoric is just egregious, deliberate distraction from what is actually happening in the financialization part of higher education. It's like, you know, let's keep everybody up in arms and doing this thing that we're really good at, by the way, because we love to debate, right? And they know that because that's what we're trained in and we know, you know, we can keep people up in arms about that. And it's wonderful for like political showmanship and you get some easy points off of that. Um, but I think the, the more challenging part of this is that the financial models for higher education uh, have been unsustainable for, I always have to do the math because I can see it 20 years for like a long time. <laughs> We're now in 2023, so it's been more like 40, 45 years. We've been unsustainable. Um, and the political climate for making it more sustainable, it, it's not happening. Um, we have not hit on a political message that seems to resonate with voters to make them more sustainable. Because what needs to happen is not a federal message as powerful as like the student loan debt uh, campaign has been, and I've certainly supported that. This is a state level message that needs to happen. This is about state level funding, and we just haven't hit on it. We can't galvanize voters around it. People have tested the messaging. It ain't happening. So if that's not going to happen, then that means it's unsustainable, right? I think we're going to see the acceleration of more privatization in the sector, which of higher education means, it doesn't mean that public schools become private. The privatization in the colleges looks more like more speculative financing models, right? Because um, you can't just wholesale take public colleges for a private, right? Um, there's some uh, really um, wonderful work happening there about how public schools kind of get hollowed out by financialization. Um, I just finished uh, reviewing a book by Charlie, and Charlie's in the last name is going to come to me here in a minute. Um, he's in California, um, really bad with names, but uh, I think we're going to see more of that. Um, I think that we have not seen sort of that sort of cyclical. Some of this has been about the nature of how COVID uh, interrupted it. Um, but I think it's interesting that we didn't see, we usually see the sort of cyclical response to enrollment increases to economic downturns that we didn't quite see over the sector. Usually like community colleges and lower cost institutions see a spike in enrollment. When we see economic insecurity, we didn't quite see that this time. And I'm not sure if that means that Americans aren't feeling as bullish on higher education. I suspect so, for lots of reasons. That, the national conversation about it's higher education not being a safer bet anymore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if, and if that's what we're looking at, sort of like the crisis in faith, <coughs> I think we also need to be worried there. Um, I don't think we have a, a ton of ceiling left to keep raising prices in higher education institutions. I don't think people can bear much more with inflation and cost of living being what it is. Again, that puts institutions behind the eight ball. Um, and I just think politically, I don't think there's a lot of will on the <coughs> other side. What does that mean? I mean, listen, the golden age of higher education financing, financing and expansion has been over for a very long time. I don't think people like what I think we see coming. Um, so you, it sounds like, I'm just, I uh, want the words you know, but it sounds like based on what you articulated that closures and. Uh, yeah, and I mean, that's just a, dem yeah, that's a demographic reality. I think we have held off on that for as long as we can. I think the institutions who know their students better know them very, very, very well. And we have got to figure out a way to do that humanely mm -hmm. and strategically. I was just talking to some university presidents about a month ago. Um, and some uh, um, some state lobbyists about where is the sort of centralized plan for how we're going to do that. What's been happening is that we've just kind of doubled down on institution by institution, um, leveraging sort of like nostalgia, especially for small private colleges, about how to save them. That's not going to work. We, that's we're going to have to figure out how we do sort of plan systematic, yes, mergers and salvage institutions um, long-term. Um, 
we're not going to be able to, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to uh, save them all. Mm -hmm. I think there are institutions given historic underfunding, chronic underfunding of institutions that should probably get state and federal funding to have uh, sort of a sort of more privileged position. There are some institutions, for example, that I think women's colleges and minority serving institutions, for example, um, that shouldn't, given what the state, states owe them uh, for historic chronic underfunding, should not be subject to the same sort of, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that they would be targeted early for strategic mergers is what I'm trying to say. Well, I think there are other institutions that should probably be on the chopping block earlier and we should have that sort of equity conversation. But that equity conversation can't happen if, again, there is no plan, strategic uh, strategy for doing it, right? Um, and I think that is deliberate. Uh, I think the state systems, for example, not thinking those kinds of things through are relying on there being a sort of um, disaster strategy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's tough. Yeah. I mean, but it's consistent. With it would be with the history of how we have funded and underfunded institutions, exactly. And, and I think it's only this is, a, this is a perfect segue to this next question, which is situated on HBCUs. Yeah. And I guess the, the sort of the major challenges and opportunities that HBCUs will face in the future. So, um, and how, and what are some, and also what are some possible solutions as it pertains to those uh, challenges? Right. I'm thinking back to what you said about women's colleges and MSIs and, and how they've been underfunded. Um, so any other thoughts on that in, in terms of uh, some possible challenges and solutions for HBCUs? Well, listen, our challenges haven't changed since we were founded, um, which is that even when we managed, I was looking at the, um, you know, our most recent court cases about, again, systemic chronic underfunding of institutions. So even when we get, um, even when we have to sue to get peer funding um, um, uh, resolved, we still don't tend to address historic underfunding, right? We tend to always start, which is the case for all of the funding of institutions in America, we always tend to want to start from the current budget model, right? And we always still, however, talking about historic funding. Um, uh, we have still never gotten to historic parity. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's not, however, a new problem, right? We can we can have we can litigate that over and over and over again, um, and we still have not solved that. So I don't know that any of those problems are new. The demographic realities are not new for historically black colleges. So none of these are new problems. I have always said that one of the great strengths of minority serving institutions is that none of the new political economy problems for higher education are new problems for us. Um, I have always said that if any colleges in the, uh, in the current model want to know how to survive, you should probably go down the street and ask us how we have survived. Um, because your reality is ours. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, if you want to know what it's like to talk to a politically recalcitrant uh, General Assembly, come ask us. Mm -hmm. We can tell you. You want to know what it's like to be in a tug of war and the culture wars, you should come ask us. We can tell you. You want to know what it's like to look at demographic realities and um, chronic underfunding and be asked to do more with less? We could probably talk to you about that. Welcome to the party. Um, if anybody is well suited for this political climate, it's us. I mean, I'm, I, it's not that I'm not worried about us. It's just that if anybody knows how to navigate this, it's us. The good news is we've been here before. All right, so I'm down to a couple of questions and I want to open this up. Um, so, the last couple of questions are uh, describe for us as also your vision for training the next generation of sociologists and cultural critics and public intellectuals. Like what, what lessons are you conveying to your students, especially around this time? I'm thinking we're in April, we're talking about this again. Uh, we're in April, this is the grind time, people are trying to complete assignments, people are trying to uh, graduate. Uh, so, what, what type of lessons are you conveying? Some of us trying to get out the door. <laughs> <laughs> they always think there's only people trying to get out. I was like, nobody wants out more than I do. Um, 
Let's see. No, we, you know what? I, I actually, it's so funny because I'm always surprised by how much my students want to engage that line of my work. I'm also a little naive about it. So, like the first day of class this semester, this was my first time on campus, by the way, full time on campus in years. Uh, I moved here during COVID. And prior to that, I had been uh, at my previous institution, always willing to sort of take one for the teams. I had been teaching online, uh, partially at least for several years. Because, you know, work for the department, fine, I'll do it, you know. Um, so I hadn't been on campus face to face with my students in at least like four years. Uh, so I stood up there in front of the classroom, was like, first of all, ooh, people, hey. <laughs> it was so amazing. And, uh, you know, have a syllabus. I know how this goes. I've been here before. I was ready to teach class. And I was a little stunned by how many of them like wanted to talk about the world. You know, like, they, you know, they had yeah, like this, but they wanted to talk the world. So I wanted to say, first of all, I'm not sure they need me to like prime them in the same way that I felt like five, six years ago. I kind of sort of had to gently say, oh, this is how we apply our learning, our, you know, what we learn in class to these big social problems in the world. I used to kind of have this little lesson plan that would then, after we learned our academic concepts and here's what social problems and this is how this, you know, now let's rip from the news and I used to have this little thing. Now, no, not a thing. Uh, if anything, I have to say to them, okay, okay, I got it. We've talked about <laughs> We got it. Union drive happened today. Got it, got it. TikTok was in the news. Got it. Now let's talk about this academic concept. I have to bring them back to the thing. Um, so don't have that problem. Uh, I work a lot to link the concept, the practice to theory, because I just think that's what we can do that you aren't going to get anywhere else. I think it's one of our superpowers of academic training, which I am, you know, sort of, you know, perhaps naively still committed to if nothing else i think that's what you pay for either in time or money mm -hmm. in coming to school for you can choose to then use it or not when you leave here i say to them but i want to say i gave it to you mm -hmm. i want to link praxis to theory in this classroom and um and I like it, so I'm you know, also a little nervous about it. I like it. I thought it was the fun part of graduate school. And so uh, I like to say, all right, so you know, here's this thing we're talking about in the world. And this is how, why I think the public discourse is talking past each other, in part because you've got this collapse of terms. You don't have clarity on, or sometimes intentionally and sometimes not. You don't have clarity on units of analysis for example, right, um, uh, people are using um, this word colloquially, but this is what it means when we use it um, more specifically. Now let's put that term in the history of the word. Let's put that term in what, what it was meant to communicate. Um, and I think it's important for them to have sort of that, like that sort of discipline thinking about it. And that's it now, when you leave here, you can throw all of that out and you can use it just like everybody else uses it and that's fine. For example, you can call something, but you should know the difference between sexism and patriarchy. <laughs> People, however, in everyday life rarely mean the distinction, but it's important that you know the distinction, right? Now you'll see, however, why everybody's arguing when they probably don't mean to be arguing. You'll now have that little super secret power. And however, when you're writing with precision, you will know what you're saying, right? Um, I try to train them on those differences because I say it will not only make you better at academic writing, ideally it would make you a better public writer should you choose to do that. I never make it an option, you know, something that they're forced to do because I think this is a really tough thing to take on, especially in this climate. I try to put my students out before any public before they're ready. And in fact, I often have to try to say to them, maybe you don't want to do that just yet. They have sometimes more energy for it than I think they have armor. And I don't want to send them out without armor just yet. Um, but I think sometimes they can see my, my public life and not see how much armor I have. And so I try to show them some of my armor in the classroom and say, OK, now talking to 100,000 people looks like this. And this is what that risk looks like. Um, but you know, they're very excited to talk to the public. They feel a sense of urgency. 
um, that again, even six years ago, I'm not sure I felt in the classroom for my students. They do feel, and I think some of this is about, they just don't think that the payoff is there for the safe professional route. They don't feel like, like they're like, what? Sit out 10, 15, for what? Right, the urgency of my life is now, right? My bodily autonomy is under threat. Mm -hmm. Democracy is burning. Mm -hmm. um, I can't afford rent, much mm -hmm. less a house. They're like, what are you saying? Like, right? They are living with even my like, well, you know, fairly economically secure students. Like for them, their life just feels already so public mm -hmm. and under attack that they're just ready to go. Mm -hmm. And so I just try to give them a sense of like what the stakes are, how not to get trapped in the distraction that comes from the slippage of lazy thinking. I was like, because if you go out there lazy, you're gonna be too easily distracted. I can spend my day all day long arguing with people who deliberately confuse the terms of what critical race theory is. Mm. Now I know what it is. Why am I arguing with a fool? I know what a book is. I've been to the library. And I said, now, you could do that, but you've been to a school, right? That, in the words of Toni Morrison, will distract you from the real work. And I just try to give them that armor, right? The real work here is this. Public discourse has gotten to the point that information society, disinformation, and misinformation could have you spend 20 out of your 24 hours on foolishness. Mm -hmm. So let me give you armor where you can separate the wheat from the shaft so you can do real work. That's all I want to be able to do. And so that's what we try to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What's next for you? Anyway, that's my last question. <laughs> <laughs> so I am the love for me to be working on two books, a memoir and a collection of essays. And really, this summer, I promise you, I'm so holding my feet to fight. What I just tell you about making myself do it, that I've hired some essays I'm going to make myself do it. I hired a graduate student for the summer whose whole job is to transcribe my notes, which means I have to produce notes. See? <laughs> that's how I'm making myself get it done. And uh, so that's my um, my whole project for this summer is to work on those uh, two books. And um, you know, keep working on the on the column. Um, you know, they've uh, the Times came to me uh, a, a couple of months ago and asked me to consider doing a podcast. So I'm letting them Ooh, talk yeah. me. I know. Yeah. I'm letting them talk me into maybe kind of sort of maybe doing that. We're we're we're, we're, we're thinking about it. And um, you know, keep talking to my students and keep trying to do the work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Let's open this up. Everyone else. Hi, Dr. Cotton. Thank you so much for being here and just sharing these words of wisdom. I feel so seen right now. So thank you. Um, you talked a lot about just survivorship in the kind of earlier parts of your career with tenure and just trying to you know, do what you have to do to, to make it and how COVID kind of slowed that down, but then getting over to the other side and having that autonomy. But I also heard you talk a lot about just all the wonderful new projects you're doing. So my question to you is, as you kind of matriculate through your career, how do you have this staying power and relevancy in academia? How do you each kind of year as you progress through decide, oh, I'm going to go this route. I'm going to go, you know, work with the New York Times, I'm going to write this essay or this book to kind of stay long term in academia because, you know, for black women, what I'm seeing is that there's kind of this exodus out of academia for various reasons. And you talked a little bit about how it's been difficult for us to kind of slow down and say, okay, I need to focus in on parts of, you know, integrating my life. So how do you stay fresh and relevant and, and, and have that staying power in academia? Well, thank you for thinking so, first of all. Um, I do think, um, you know, I. I'm a little bit of an insider outsider and always have been. I mean, some of that's my personality. I think some of it has just been my, like my path through academia, which was that I was never deeply embedded in, um, you know, I wasn't very cliquish. Mm -hmm. 
again, person a personality thing. I'm an only child. I was never very good at joining. <laughs> um, and I think uh, while it probably made my earlier part of my career harder, I think at this stage of my career, it probably makes things a little easier. Because what it means is that I have less, um, I just don't know some things. There's a lot of freedom that I get from like some stuff. I just don't have enough, uh, I just don't know enough of the mess <laughs> to know what probably what I'm not supposed to do. So I really do have a finer sense of my own voice mm -hmm. where I just go, well, okay, I say to myself, you know, like, what about this? You know, I don't, I don't have, I'm not listening to what other people do and I'm paying more attention to what they do. Mm -hmm. Because what I do is see is I see what people are writing. I see what they're publishing, right? I can't read the work and I can see where the field is going or I can see what projects are happening. So I have less people's voices, the mm -hmm. comments, the this or that, the gossip or whatever, but I can see the field of work and I go, okay, that looks exciting. That looks like something I can engage with or that looks like a direction I can take. And um, and that is more like uh, fulfilling for me, it's more exciting for me. Um, and so, yeah, I just remember early on, like somebody saying something to me in graduate school, and I was like, yeah, I know that's what they say, do, but that's not what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, it's just a, there was such a big gap between yeah. all of this and what people were actually doing. Yeah. And if I follow up this, what people were doing, is that the people who had the types of careers or were making the kinds of decisions that looked <laughs> like something I could imagine for myself, they were doing work, frankly. Like, I was like, oh, that's a book I can see myself doing. Or like, that's a project I can see myself doing. It wasn't stuff that people were talking about. Mm -hmm. That was stuff people were doing. Mm -hmm. And so like, if I just kind of keep my eye on the horizon of actual work, kind of let the rest of it fall away, you know, it's a little bit easier. Because when you let what people are saying fall away, first of all, a lot of stuff, and a lot of people, frankly, I realized more, fewer people work than people talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a lot less to keep up with if yeah. I focus on work. <laughs> but thank you for thinking so. I mean, in choosing things, it gets, you know, it's tougher. It would probably, my, you know, my life would be streamlined if I chose probably one thing over the other. I mean, at this point in my career, I'm still in academia. One, the parts that I, I feel like I can do more good for people being here. You know, I was in class this semester. There's a young black woman sitting in the front. Um, she didn't say anything all the first class session. And, you know, I make everybody do the, I don't actually make everybody do the introduction thing because I acknowledge people are introverts, extroverts, right? Mm -hmm. So I say to people, if you want to introduce yourself, you introduce yourself. The other thing you can do is I hand out note cards and you can tell me about yourself that way. So the people who wanted to do that, I collect them at the end. She had given me hers, and on hers she said, um, and I asked them why they were taking this class, and on hers she only had one comment. She was taking this class because I would be the only black teacher she'd ever had. Wow. Wow. She was a graduate school, and she'd been in school for a long time. Wow. And I was going to be the only black professor she's ever had. So, I mean, in part, I do this work because of that. Yes. I don't need to do it so much for myself anymore. Mm -hmm. But I do it because as we go, there are so, fewer and fewer of us. Mm -hmm. And we're in a much different time in education than when I was coming up. We're, the, we're just some of the few people some of us are seeing mm -hmm. at each stage of our career. And I just think it matters so much more now. Um, and I think about that, too. At some point, less some parts of my life are less about me than they are about other people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So again, I want to thank you for your uh, insight and perspective, and thank you for being you and keeping it real with us here <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this this morning. And actually, you answered many of the questions I was jotting down questions to ask you, and you ended up addressing many of them in your talk. I do want to ask you about your take on uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, where do you think that's going in terms yes. of impact on working class people, middle class, Great individuals, question. and really society in general, right? Even I started having some thoughts about that uh -huh. in the colonialist uh, framework 
for um, your yeah. society <laughs> that may not even be thinking on that level yet, what mm -hmm. that would look like uh, in a global context. Provost Jackson, I think that is a fabulous question and one that my colleagues and I at CTAP are talking about a lot and that I was just on a, I've been thinking about a lot the last couple of months and have been on a lot of talks and a lot of rooms talking about like the last six months has been a lot of my life thinking about it. And I suspect it's going to be a lot of our lives thinking about it over the next couple of years. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to just do it down because I've got so much I want to say we've been thinking about. Um, so I think we have more questions right now than we have answers. We're at that stage of things, right? So the first thing is that um, I want to say, interestingly enough, the same people who are the same players that were in the rooms of the for-profit college conversation are the same people who were in the room for the AI conversation. By which I mean, these are the same venture capitalists that I was talking to, interviewing, and following. The same finance class, which I find very interesting. This is a very small group of people when you start talking about billionaires and investors and incubators and financial accelerators. Um, you know, there are 1,000 billionaires. You're, it, the, 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 the billionaire financial class is very, very small. The tech class that uh, that is parallel to it is also small. It's a little slightly larger, but also fairly small. Um, and I think that matters for a couple of reasons. I think this is a world view. This is a political class and a tech class and a financial class is sort of wedded to each other. And this is about how they think about what innovation looks like for the rest of the world. And I see a ton of overlap there about what they think efficiency and education and work, right, and disruption looks like for everybody else. And so one of the things that I think overlaps from who was funding, incubating, innovation, disruption in the for-profit college sector later in the um, in the way that sort of spilled over and who some of those similar players are, um, so the Peter Thiel's of the world, et cetera, that come from that world. They were fin fin financing things like micro-credentials and um, uh, massive open online classes and some of the platforms that came out of that sort of bubble. Um, you also see in the um, um, uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, sort of space, it's the same sort of like approach to problem solving, um, which is that they aren't really solving a problem. It is a technology without an actual problem um, initially. Um, and so I think one of the first things, one, one of the reasons why we see some of the panic uh, narrative about AI right now is that it's actually one of the technological efficiencies that isn't coming for working class people first. Mm -hmm. This one is actually, its initial wave of promises is a disruption of white collar workers. Mm -hmm which was also similar to some of the disruptions that were similar to the for-profit college bubble, which was, this is a tech class where, so we're talking about some of the disruptions that they are seeing the promise, some of which I think is significantly overhyped, by the way, um, as AI stands right now, which is journalists, they're seeing, you know, their promising disruptions to lawyers, or certainly, you know, contract law, anyway, these types of, is it, uh, um, uh, professional class uh, work where they are writing intensive um, and the writing is rote, right? It's sort of um, highly structured writing, things where the patterns are easily discernible and they can be reproduced uh, over and over again. Um, now, I would argue, I argue that that kind of writing has already been sort of mechanized in a certain kind of way, and I think it is very limited. I think the ceiling on that kind of work is pretty limited. I argue that it's not highly disruptive, but I think it is probably going to change some of that professional work to a certain degree. But that's work that was already being highly disrupted by the, <coughs> the uh, legal sector had already been really sort of uh, disrupted the last 10 or so years. You can talk to people in the legal hiring field, which I'm sure the folks over at the law school can kind of tell you, and it had already been uneven for quite some time, hiring um, and promotion over there. There've been a lot of layoffs in those sectors. Same in journalism. So I'm not sure, I think they're over-hyping the promise of AI being disruptive as it currently stands. 
it is more disruptive if they can find a use case for it for working class people because historically technological innovation so sort of Taylorism where technology can make work cheaper and faster for working class people like fact at the factory type level type work if they can find a use case for it like that that's more potentially revolutionary to the labor market because that tends to drive down wages and undercut unionization mm -hmm. and right now these are not highly unionized fields right Journalism, law, these are not highly, you know, I just don't see a big revolutionary use case for it there where it's like on the disruptive labor market. But they can find one um, for working class people. I think it probably, it has more use value there, but so far nothing has been proposed that I see um, for it there. I think the more dangerous use case for it, frankly, um, is its rhetoric and its political capital. Um, because for whatever reason, well, I know probably the reason, the billionaires, right? <laughs> wherever, there's a lot of, wherever there's a lot of money, you're going to have a lot of political interest. And like when I'm out here talking to people, like nobody's asking a ton of critical questions about this stuff. Like the way that people are willing to accept the marketing on AI without asking any of the potential legal or political questions about it. So I was sitting with some legal scholars. Um, one of the foremost um, uh, First Amendment lawyers was in the room um, with us last week at UNC, and he was terrified at the thought of like what happens to privacy with artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. And now this is the one where I think that poor and working class people and black and minority people are vulnerable, not so much in the workspace, but in the idea of privacy and property, which is if we ain't never been able to own anything in this country, we can own ourselves, mm -hmm. meaning quite literally ourselves. If we ain't got nothing, as my great grandmother used to say, we can own our own little right mind and our own little selves at our house. What artificial intelligence can do is so effectively separate a person from our right to ourselves as private, as a private person, because law has not caught up with the fact that artificial intelligence can create a version of you that has no rights. Now, who do you think they're coming up for, for first with that? As, the, as, the, as, we're, as they were explaining in this First Amendment workshop, they can make basically a version of you that has your voice, your likeness, and say that you don't own it. Can, he said that we don't have anything in contract law that then says that entity can't sign a contract. As you, so you know how hard poor people, for example, used to have to fight to own and keep our little property, for example, or own and keep our little land, or you think about something like intellectual property, which in this day and age in a digital society is extremely valuable. We don't have any legal structure right now that says that the artificial intelligence version of you is not you. And I've got to believe that somehow somebody like, oh, I don't know, a Bill Gates is going to figure out a way that his version of himself is going to be obscured <laughs> and cordoned off and the version of a young black version of somebody isn't going to be. And I've got to believe that there's going to be, as we have always had, a tiered justice system of artificial intelligence where the rights of some people's AI is going to look differently than the rights to other people's. And so I think the work case for it is far less troubling to me than this idea of who gets to be constituted as human with whose rights. That I think like everything that has always happened in this country is going to be differential and unequal. And the legal system right now has no impetus whatsoever to care about figuring out a legal structure for that. Uh, because this is not one that has decided it cares very much about thinking about systematic inequality. Mm -hmm. Right? This is not a Supreme Court climate, for example that thinks that we have um, a country that needs a voting rights act, mm -hmm. for example. That mm -hmm. does not lend itself to me to think that we have a, um, a court system that is going to care about getting a legal framework that's going to figure out um, uh, these sorts of very complex legal 
questions. But yeah, that's more concerning to me about where working class people and poor people and people of color are going to fall in the artificial intelligence debates. Yeah. I'm losing a lot of sleep over this one, is what I'm saying. Because I think we're early in the conversation and we're missing the boat. I'm hoping, I'm honestly, I'm hoping Reverend Barbara Root and his folks over more on Mondays figures out the line on this one because they did a great job of figuring it out where the economic hardship line was in student loan debates and getting uh, poor working class black folk to figure out that this was part, that they had a stake in that one too. And I thought that was super important because nobody like a preacher figures out the through line. That's right here. Uh, and so I'm really hoping they also figure this one out. They've done great about figuring out where the new civil rights line is and these new emerging social problems. Because um, somebody got to figure out how, how to tell regular folks that this thing is coming and then not make it sound like science fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. As you can hear from my answer, I ain't the one. Because I didn't come <laughs> Somebody, and I, so I got a lot of hope in this record. <laughs> well, maybe. I sound too much like I'll take your butler or something when I say it, but like, somebody got to say. Somebody got to put that in the right terms. <laughs> Um, um, Dr. Cobb, um, as a student and um, someone who just, what I've been reading so far, just admires your technique and your words, um, give us, uh, fellow graduate students, some advice on your mechanics when you're doing your research, some tips in developing your thoughts, your words, putting your ideas together, um, to make your argument you know, oh, yeah. clearly, concisely. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, above all, read. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. I think everybody hates hearing it because it's the most time intensive thing and it's the one thing you're trying to make you be the most efficient with, which is your time. Um, uh, but read, and I'm not, and I actually don't mean just read uh, like your sign reading, your scholarship. Actually, the most important thing you read not the most important thing, that's not true, you need to read your stuff too, but, uh, but but when I say read, I mean truly just read anything. Mm -hmm. Reading anything will make your argument better. Mm -hmm. Read manga, read magazines, read anything. Read anything will make your argument better. Mm -hmm. Good reading in any context will make your argument better. I can read Reader's Digest, which by the way, I do, I keep me a Reader's Digest, because um, <laughs> it fits so nicely in your purse. But like, read, really, read, anything. A sharp, short argument in anything will make your argument better. Um, and you never know, I believe in divergent uh, thinking, uh, which is, you know, this idea of reading across big ideas and uh, 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 divergent ideas or different ideas and trying to find connections among them. And not trying, just like your brain, try to see what comes up among them. So like, you know, if you're working on education, read something in art. Right? Like getting your brain outside of the thing you're working on to see what connection, what sparks what um, can be very helpful. Um, I don't have this time anymore, but I used to when I was in graduate school, I used to go to the bookstore and pick up randomly, kind of close my eyes and pick 10, 12 random magazines from the magazine rack, you know, <laughs> and I sit there at the table and flip through them and read them for a couple of hours at a time. Just to, just to look at something different, read something different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, reading. Um, if you have, if you struggle with the blank page, and I think that can be just a psychological barrier for a lot of people, technology has come so far. Talk. Use your voice memos on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, talk through the argument. Talk to type. Your Google Docs can do that for you. Talk to text talk out the argument and then edit it. It's easier to edit than it is to write. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, your brain just understands editing different than writing. Mm -hmm. Editing junk is easier than writing. This is. Um, so talk to text. Uh, and then look up this concept called reverse outlining. Reverse outlining. That's sort of a next to last step in your writing process, but it can be really helpful to make sure that you have done what you think you've done. You've done what you think you've done. It's called reverse outlining. 
Um, just as a follow up, I am from Eastern North Carolina, and I've probably been to your house in Red Springs or where you from in Eastern Carolina. Fairmont, North Carolina. I know Fairmont. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what I said. In most places, I wouldn't even bother saying, you yeah. know what I mean, because it's not even worth it. But yes, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. If you've been to Rest Range, you have been by my people's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. I know Fairmont. Yeah, so listen, Rest Range is actually a city for my folks. That's where my daddy's people are. My mama's from the country. They're from Shannon, which is right Shannon. outside of that. <gasps> you know Shannon. Yeah. 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 Well, we kind of own Shannon. We're yeah. kings in Shannon. <laughs> Shannon's my whole family. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, my daughter, um, yeah. um, Robert Aspiring Learner, oh, and wonderful. does not have the direction that you have. Um, she's English, you said, compared to literature, but she hasn't honed that. What do you say? She's a student at UNC. What do you say to students um, when they come in and they have that skill set, mm -hmm. but they have no uh, direction where they want to take it? They and you with other writers. writers. She, she's at Carolina. Mm -hmm. Tell her to go over to Epilogue Bookstore. Tell her to start hanging out over at Epilogue. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful little group there of writers, readers, thinkers. Most students, little eyeballs, are the cutest little people. They're little poetry circles. They're so cute. I hang out over there and try to support them. They have mm -hmm. my books and I donate to them and I think they're lovely. So tell her she just has to find her people. Mm -hmm. Writers need each other. They're strange people individually. <laughs> so they, need groups. they need to find the little groups. I think that's a wonderful first step. May I ask your last name? My married name is Thompson. I mean, I'm born out, but the You're family right. name you'll know is I'm Griffin. Yes, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. All right, nice to meet you. To thank you again for your phenomenal sharing. You touched on a topic that's real dear to me. You talked about small private institutions may not be acceptable or be able to save them. And you mentioned the idea of strategic yeah. merger. Could you elaborate on yeah. that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen a couple, not as many as we would like, I think. Um, and the ones that, have, um, that we have seen work are ones where the institutions took it upon themselves. So. To be fair, they're private, so there's no state, you know, there's no states can't make them do it. Um, and we've seen a couple of state ones too, of small colleges, of forced mergers, obviously. But private institutions are basically taking it upon themselves, which is to seek out, you know, two institutions that have, usually they have to have some shared mission, which often means usually a religious tradition, the one that I know of that worked with, they had a shared religious background, which, okay, fine. Right, uh, and then they has to, you know there has to be some negotiation between usually the boards and the alumni at these institutions, which are usually deeply devoted. Also, usually it has to have some right. Um, but yeah, you need the the strategic part of this is that it needs to be planned because you don't want you don't want to be in economic distress because once you get in economic distress and you're just trying to hold off creditors, it becomes a lot more dire. So strategic is. You know demographically where your enrollment projections are going to be, right? Usually, if you've been doing discipline sort of enrollment management, you know two or three years in advance whether or not you've got the enrollment numbers to meet your budget, for example. You can usually start, you know where your alumni enthusiasm is, you know whether or not you've got perspectives, enthusiasm. So a strategic merger would be looking down the pipeline and starting to develop the relationships you need, starting to have those conversations with the stakeholders, your alumni, your, your board, about what those what a strategic merger would look like, right? Um, and whether or not it's possible. If it's not possible, then a strategic closure, right? Strategic closure looks like not just showing up one day and having the lights off. Right? Having a planned teach out for the students who are still currently enrolled so that they know where their documents are going to be held, so that they know what the transfer plans are for those who continue who intend to continue on, right? So that they know where their credit hours are going to go, how those things are going to be governed. Right. So there are ways to do that in a way that I think can maintain the student investment in the institution, the alumni investment in the institution, which listen, can still be important for the institution. Parts of institutions can live on. Some institutions, parts of the professional schools can live on, for example. 
um, alumni circles can live on. You want to salvage the parts, I think, of the institution that can survive. But when you have these sort of dire economic, when you get to those levels and you just close overnight, you can lose all that kind of goodwill. And that's why I think the strategic um, closures are important. Yeah. Use that as our last question. Um, and I regret that we don't have more time. Just I just do. This is a wonderful question. So it's wonderful meeting everyone. This was an incredible wide ranging conversation. I really very much enjoyed it. Um, thank you so much for your time. You all, as we, as, we bring, as we bring our conversation to a close, I am, I am humbled by the presence of Dr. Cotton and, and the conversations that we've shared today. We are so happy that she is rooted in the foundations of the Verda, of the Roller Hills, and Verda Green has taken that information and just kind of skyrocketed it in her career and shared so eloquently with us today. I um, I was supposed to present her, and I will do that with just a gorgeous eagle. The eagle didn't get, we didn't get it completed. So I would either have to um, mail her the eagle, or either she'll have to swing back by here because that eagle is, is large and it's delicate. But uh, we do, uh, we are so greatly appreciative of her time, of her thought, of her sharing with us today. And if you don't mind, just giving her another round of applause. <laughs> we would like to just continue to follow her work, continue to be empowered by her thought processes, and uh, continue sharing. So you know I'll sit with you and make sure that you get. So again, thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you very much.